So welcome back to part two of a series that we started last week called The Battle of Your Life. The Battle of Your Life. The battle between what, what we can see, uh, or well, behind what we can see and feel and touch. In other words, behind the physical world in which we live lies another realm, the spiritual realm. And although you can't see it or feel it or touch it, it's no less real than the physical realm. And just as the physical realm is not as God would want it to be in terms of how we treat each other, the state of society in general, and the tragedies that occur on a daily basis, so the spiritual realm has gone wrong too. And we were looking at how this has come about and at the consequences of our, for our daily lives. And we've seen how just as ordinary people have decided that they know best, that they don't need God in their lives, that they are capable of making up their own rules and living by them. So the same thing happened in heaven, led by Lucifer, an angel known as a cherub. A third of the angels in heaven rebelled against God and were consequently cast out. Lucifer's chief aim is to turn people away from God and towards himself so that they'll worship him rather than God. People often make the mistake of looking at the state that the world is in and saying, well, how can there be a God of love when all this is happening? How can he allow earthquakes and tsunamis and droughts and famines and so on? And the mistake is that they assume that this world displays God's handiwork. Whereas the reality is this world displays Lucifer's handiwork. This world is not as God intended it to be. It is a fallen, messed up distortion of what it was originally supposed to be like. The world still has echoes of God's original creation. You can still look, for example, at a beautiful sunset or a majestic mountain or whatever and sense the majesty of it all. But in the main, we can see a lot more of Lucifer's hand, handiwork. This is all part of the spiritual battle. In this battle, Lucifer will use and does use anything he possibly can to impose his agenda, which is misery, despondency, division, defeat, and so on. And we were looking just last time at some of those tactics. Well, another fundamental weapon that he uses is words, what we say to each other. Don't forget that I was saying uh, last time that Satan is a title, not a name. The title Satan means accuser, and it reveals one of the most successful tactics, which is to get people to accuse one another, to use words to hurt each other, to destroy relationships but also to destroy lives. Because words have more power than we might think. They not only have the power to hurt us at the time they were uttered, they have the power to steer and direct our lives. So, for example, the words, you're so ugly and stupid, no one could ever love you, you'll never find someone, are not only really hurtful to hear, but Satan hears those words and uses them as a means to lock you into them so that you find your life is beginning to turn out like those words said it would. It's not just chance or bad luck, it's Satan having taken those words and used them to make your life conform to them. Words are that powerful. We can have them said to us, or we can say them ourselves. I knew someone once who really wanted to be married and have children, and yet it had just never happened. And this was a, a real source of unhappiness for her, and she just couldn't understand why. And as we talked about it, it turned out that she had a sister and had made a vow that she would not get married before her sister did. So she was seeing a man at this time, but knew that she would wait for her sister to, to, to get married first. Then her sister started dating someone. Sadly though, it was this person's boyfriend who dumped her in favour of the sister. Well, they got married, leaving this person that I was talking to single, alone and betrayed. She vowed 
that she would never trust a man again. And now, years later, that vow was still in force, still preventing her from meeting a man and getting married. Words are powerful things. In fact, as the Bible puts it, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It's full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it's set on fire by hell itself. In other words, our words are used by Satan as weapons in this spiritual battle. And there are millions and millions of casualties in this spiritual battle. You can be a casualty whether you're a Christian or not. And unless we understand how Satan uses words as weapons in this battle that we're in, we're going to be casualties. Here's the first thing that we need to understand about words. They have the power to shape our lives. Words aren't just lifeless sounds that provide us with information. They're living. They're powerful and they come filled with spiritual reality. What you say can preserve life or destroy it, the Bible says, so you must accept the consequences of your words. The power that words have increases according to the authority that the person giving us those words has in our lives. If a total stranger says something nasty to us, that's going to be upsetting, but really just a passing thing. At worst, it's going to set set us off in a bad mood for a while. But if someone who has importance or authority in our lives says something hurtful or negative or condemning, that goes far deeper because our hearts are open uh, towards that person. So Satan is far more easily able to pick the condemning words up and fire them into our open hearts. Of course, the, the reverse is true as well. If an upbuilding word, an encouraging word, is spoken to us by someone who is in authority over us, that has an impact that goes beyond just making us feel better. It has a positive spiritual impact that shapes our lives in a positive way. The Christian writer and psychologist, Dr. Larry Crabb, wrote about an incident in the church that he attended as a young man. It was customary in this church that young men were encouraged to participate in the communion services by praying out loud. Well, feeling the pressure of expectation, the young Larry Crabb, who had problems with stuttering, stood to pray. In a terribly confused prayer, he recalls, thanking the Father for hanging on the cross and praising Christ for triumphantly bringing the Spirit from the grave. When he was finished, he vowed he would never again speak or pray out loud in front of a group. At the end of the service, not wanting to meet any of the church elders who might try to tell him all the things he had said wrong in his prayer, Crabb made for the door. Before he could get out, an older man called Jim Dunbar caught him. Having prepared himself for the anticipated correction, Larry Crabb instead found himself listening to these words. Larry, there's one thing I want you to know. Whatever you do for the Lord, I'm behind you 1,000%. And Larry Crabb reflects in his book, which is called encouragement, the key to caring. Even as I write these words, my eyes fill with tears. I have yet to tell that story to an audience without at least mildly choking. Those words were life words. They had power. They reached deep into my being. Words have the power to shape our lives. Satan knows that, which is why he really wants us to curse each other. And if a negative word from someone, which we can call a curse, or a negative word from within ourselves, which we can call a pronouncement, has the power to change the course of our lives, how much more does the power of a life word, a positive, encouraging word, 
and going to the very top of the tree, how powerful would a life word be coming from God himself? Well, here it is. Here is the life word. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to me than a whole flock of sparrows. You know, words are more powerful than we can imagine. As Proverbs chapter 15 verse 4 puts it, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. We can use words to bless people and we can use words to curse people. There is spiritual power in words, whichever way we use them. With words, we can bless or we can curse. As the Bible says, blessings and curses come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. If only we realised the power of words and chose in the light of that realisation to bless rather than curse. But the good news in all of this spiritual battle, this battle for our lives, is that when you start a relationship with Jesus Christ, you move into the realm of choice. You can choose to accept blessings or curses. The great thing is we can get to a place where we aren't just passive recipients of whatever is spoken into our lives. We have a choice. That's what God himself says. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life, that you and your descendants might live. I mean, we can't build lives that avoid ever hearing a negative, hurtful word. That's just ridiculous. What we can do is build lives where we can discern whether something is from God or from Satan. Choose to accept the one and reject the other. Why would we bother doing that? Because the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose, says Jesus Christ, is to give life in all its fullness. Satan wants to tear you down. He wants to rob you of self-esteem and self-worth and a right sense of confidence. He wants to make sure that everything good that's planned for your life is robbed from you. He wants to curse everything that God intended to be a blessing in your life. God's purpose, on the other hand, is to give you life in all its fullness. How do we move from living under those curses? Curses like you're stupid, you're ugly, you'll never amount to anything, you'll turn out just like your father, and so on. How do we resist the curses and make ourselves available to the blessings? Well, we need to accept words that match up to what Jesus says about us. And we need to resist and reject the rest. It was with just this belief in mind that I wrote the book, My Confession. You are who God says you are. Know the truth, speak it out and live it. The truth of who God says you are is all contained in his word, the Bible. There is great power in aligning what we say with the, the truth of the Bible, what, what it says about us, about the situations we face, about the character and the heart of God. Aligning what we say, bringing our words into agreement with the word of God is what confession is all about. As we come into agreement with God's word and speak it out, our minds begin to change from defeat to faith. The power of God is unleashed into the situations that we face. Confessing, coming into agreement with what God says about us and our situation 
is not an attempt to manipulate God into giving us what we want. It's coming to see things from God's perspective, allowing his truth to form our beliefs, shape our words, change our lives. Choosing to agree with God, not with Satan. And crucially, making the truth that we hear come to life by speaking it out, by declaring it, living in the light of it, allowing it to begin to shape our lives. You're in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual battle. It's the battle of our lives. But we don't need to be casualties any longer. Know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So Lord, I pray right now that we would choose, make the choice to listen to your words. Make the choice to agree with what you say about us, not what anybody else says about us. That we would take the truth of your word, apply it to our lives and speak out the truth that you say about us. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Lord, would you set us free in this spiritual battle we're in, free from being dragged down by the lies that Satan whispers in our ears, set free to hear the words of truth, to hear the life words, to own the life words, to let them go into our hearts and to make them real by speaking them out. Know the truth, the truth will set you free. Lord, I thank you that you present us with a choice. We don't have to listen to the lies of Satan. We can listen to and receive the life words that you, Jesus Christ, speak into our hearts. And that is what I choose in this coming week. May we all choose the same. If the sun sets you free, You'll be free indeed. Set us free, Lord, by the truth that you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is, a, this is a battle that we're in. It is the battle for our lives, but it's the battle that Jesus says, I have overcome this world. So as we trust in him, as we believe in his words spoken over us, if we, as we receive the truth that he says about us, then we shall be free indeed. So I pray that that's your experience increasingly in this coming week and beyond. Have a great week, everyone, and see you again next time for the third instalment of this spiritual battle, the battle for our lives. See you then.